to start off today with a little story, a story about this young boy. He had a very special place all of his own. It was up in the top of an old fruit tree that was out on their farm. And it was out in the backyard. It was large. It was so big. It had many branches and lots of thick leaves. And this little boy would go high up in to a point where he could just sit and he could just dream his life away up in this spot in the tree. He would be t pretend he was a spaceship commander um, traveling to galaxies unknown. He was a Tarzan living in the jungle world. He was a philosopher, an explorer, pretty much anything that he wanted to be at the moment, he would do in this tree. And it wasn't just for playtime either. He would actually go there when he felt mistreated or misunderstood, or maybe he wanted to just be alone. That tree was his hideaway. That tree was very special to him. And one day he overheard his father telling his mother, I think I'm going to cut down that old tree in the back, that old fruit tree. It hasn't produced fruit in many years. Boy, what could the little boy do? He didn't want to go beg his father because he'd have to tell him why he needed that tree to stay. And then it wouldn't be a secret anymore. So he came up with this wonderful plan. Since there was an apple tree field nearby, he got his best friend to come and help him gather all these apples. And then that evening, whenever his parents were busy inside, he and his friend went up and they tied all these apples onto the tree, all over the tree, tied all these apples. And then the next morning, the father went out to look and he saw this old tree that had never produced fruit for years was full of big juicy apples. And the little boy was so anxious to see how his father was going to react. The father came back in to the mom and he said, you are not going to believe what happened last night. It was clearly a miracle. And she was listening with bated breath and he said, yes, you know that old fruit tree? In the backyard, she's like, yeah. He says, the one that hadn't had fruit on it for years. She said, yes. She's like, it is covered with big, juicy apples almost on every branch. And she's like, well, that is a miracle. That's remarkable. He said, it really is truly remarkable because that tree is actually a pear tree. <laughs> that boy had no idea. Don't be deceived. That is exactly how Paul started out the message you heard earlier from Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Sometimes we convince ourselves that something is true when it's definitely not. We give ourselves a pat on the back for doing something kind and we go and brag about it. That should prove to us that we're not doing it for the right reason. Paul is telling us to stop kidding ourselves. Do not be deceived. I think people try to do that to themselves all the time. And are we fooling ourselves into thinking what we do in life doesn't matter? Because scripture is clear. What we sow, we will reap. Paul tells us flat out, don't be deceived because you will reap exactly what you sow. If you're sowing goodness, you're going to reap goodness. If you're sowing evil, you will reap evil. Just like the little boy's story reminded us, the pear tree is not going to produce apples. The actions you and I take today are going to yield the fruits for years to come. And that kind of future, whatever is going to be in store from, for us, is going to be because of the fruit that we yield now. We must decide what kind of fruit that is going to be. And then Paul further reminds us that we're not only trying to kid ourselves, we may think we're going to kid God as well. We can't fool him. He cannot be mocked. That's what scripture said. And when we mock, we're not being authentic or real. And we may not intend to be deceitful. Mocking someone still is showing disrespect and dishonor. And the most easily recognized form of mockery is to show by verbal insults and to point the finger at those that, that do such things. But that's still putting people in disregard. But there is more subtle mockery of God and maybe could be the most dangerous. And that comes from those of us who are believers. And I'm pretty sure we're all guilty of this when we ignore God. You know, if you've ever been ignored before, I'm sure you can understand how that feels. And maybe you have experienced that when you are trying to talk to your kids or your spouse or have a conversation with a friend and no one seems to be listening or paying attention. You feel ignored, you feel disrespected, and you feel hurt. Now think of the hurt that God must feel when we ignore him. Think of how his heart must break. But even though the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we ignore him. We act as if he weren't there. 
or consider how he must feel when he speaks and gives us guidance through his word and we choose to ignore that. No one likes to be ignored and especially God and he won't stand for it. When we choose to ignore others, we're certainly not communicating respect. And when we choose to mock and ignore God, we are certainly not respecting him. We're using him as if, as if he's an old rag to wipe off our sin. We become so cavalier about it, too, that we think that God's grace is going to come hand in hand with our faith all the time. But it's not ever meant to be a one-ended relationship. For example, grace is not an excuse to live in sin. Scripture clearly tells us that we've been called to be living a pure and holy life as believers. And Jesus Christ will set us free from our sin, any sin that we commit on earth, as long as we come to him in prayer and we confess that sin and we repent and turn away. You know, that is the word right there that's the most important, turn away. He is not going to stand for us habitually keep creating that same sin over and over and over again. And if we do, the consequences will be devastating. In Christ, we are set free from sin and all the trappings that go along with it, but we are not set free to do anything we want. We're set free to serve God, to serve others in his name. Thank God for the freedom that he's given us through Christ because we can only find that kind of peace in him, in and through our risen Savior. However, the grace of God does not eliminate the fact that we still have a choice, which then ends up with consequences. Our decisions bring results, and if we try to deceive ourselves to think that God's grace is going to not allow us to suffer from harm because we're Christians, we really need to pick up the Bible and start reading again. When we believe such things like that, we're not taking the death of Jesus Christ seriously. We are forgetting how tremendous his sacrifice was for us. What we do in life regarding our character and our hope for eternity that goes so far beyond just getting to heaven. What we sow now will reflect our heavenly rewards. It will reflect, reflect our punishments in heaven. God has created laws. Those laws rule the cause and effect of our lives, both for believers and unbelievers. Paul continues, a man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. And the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And he's reminding us that what we reap, we will sow for forever. That's not just for tomorrow, not for the next day, but for forever into eternity. Every action we take will have an impact on our future. And we need to be deliberate about the seeds we plant. We need to have a purpose for planting them. And most of all, we need to do it with our eyes on the future. The harvest of our life should always be in our front and center in our minds. Paul's principle wasn't new. Jesus taught us the same thing in the parable about the farmer who sowed good seed in his field. Then when he went to sleep, his enemy came and sowed bad seed among the good. No one knew about the two kinds of seeds until they started to grow. And then a servant realized that bad was coming up with good. And they knew that the farmer didn't do it. Somebody did it. But it just proved that you sow what you reap. You and I are planting seeds every single day. The idea of sowing and reaping, it's a basic principle of life. It is irrevocable. There is no escape. Doesn't matter if you're a believer or an unbeliever. It's the law of life. The farmer understands this principle so much better than anybody else. And when the farmer sows corn, he knows he's going to get corn. If he sows wheat, he knows he's going to get wheat. By the same logic, we need to remember if you drive by breaking all the laws on the road and speeding all the time, most likely you're going to reap a ticket or even worse. When we put our trust, though, in Jesus for salvation, then we should be sowing the seeds that the Holy Spirit supplies us. This is not to say that doing good works 
will make us somehow acceptable to God to earn eternal life. I'm not saying that. But in his letter to Ephesians, Paul puts it this way. It is clearly by the grace that we are saved. But having been saved, we have a purpose. And that is the good works which God saved us to do. Those who have not put their trust in Jesus, they plant different seeds. And instead of planting the seeds that, the, that pleases the Spirit, they plant the seeds of their own sinful nature, seeds that gratify their own desires. Those who plant these bad seeds, they're not concerned with their harvest. Their eye is only on what is happening right now, only on the planting time. And the seeds come so easy, so they're happy. And their happiness is way important to them than the harvest. We have got to decide what we're going to plant. With our soul always looking forward to the harvest, or our flesh will get caught up in the fun of the planting time. Scripture tells us a story about a couple, Ananias and Sapphira, and they sold a piece of property that they owned. And they were supposed to take all the money that they got from that sale and put it into the community. Give it all back. But they didn't. They kept part of the money for themselves. And the wife had full knowledge of it. The husband knew everything that was going on. They both were completely aware of what was happening in the situation. But they made others, they made everyone else think that they gave all of the money that they got to them. And they felt strongly that they could fool all the people around them. They were actually making them think they planted one kind of seed. When in reality, they planted another. I think they wanted to appear as spiritual as everyone else. The thing that they forgot, though, was they didn't figure God into their equation. And he was definitely going to let their deceit be known. They weren't able to pull the wool over his eyes, of course, and he was not going to be mocked. So he had the Holy Spirit reveal to Peter what was going on. Listen to what Peter said in Act 5.3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has to fill your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. You know, of course, if you remember the end of that story, Ananias dropped dead on the spot. But the point is that Ananias and his wife tried to make people think they were something they were not. They tried to give them the impression that they were sowing a spiritual life, when in reality they were lying, and not only to the people, but to God. You know, God was not going to be deceived. He knew what was going on. I think we forget sometimes that God cannot be fooled. And he knows everything. He can discern our very thoughts and our attitudes. Anything that's in our hearts, he already knows. We can make people think that we have their best interest in mind and our motives are all pure and true. But God always knows. And if we think we're going to be the one that, gets, that fools him, we have a rude awakening coming to us. You know, our harvest is always determined by what we sow. And what we sow is not just in our spiritual life, but it's also in our private life. Scripture stated, a man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. Scripture spells it out for us. When we please ourselves in our life, we're going to define our outcome and it is not going to be good. If we only worry about ourselves and um, what we want, our spiritual life is most likely going to be fruitless. When we only consider what feels good to us, then we are sowing a sinful nature. And Paul makes it clear that that will lead to destruction. But by pleasing the Spirit, it says please the Spirit and then create for eternity. So that's what we want to remember. It's going to be beyond amazing during our earthly life and our eternal life if our lives have been spent planting seeds that the Holy Spirit directs. If we truly sow to please the Spirit, I promise you, we will not be disappointed. And we will definitely know when that harvest comes in why it did. How about the seeds we plant in our relationships? 
We must invest in others to sow a solid friendship. We can't live our lives just staying and being afraid to put ourselves out there, especially when God puts certain people in our lives. We never know why that is. They're there for a reason. And he does not do anything by accident. And when we allow ourselves to be involved with others, we grow closer to what God wants us to be. And possibly we're helping them grow closer to what God wants them to be. Sometimes our part is only meant to plant the seed. And then someone comes along that actually helps that seed grow. You know how you'll say people are in your uh, life for just seasons. They don't always stay. But if we plant what we want to be real relationships, the ones that are going to challenge us and to change us and to bring blessings to our lives, then we have to be willing to risk. We have to be willing to take a risk on putting our heart on the line. And sometimes you're going to get hurt. But you got to start planting these seeds to make a difference. Now, it doesn't mean that um, that risk won't always be worthwhile. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work out, but that risk could also be what changes our life for the better. The last point in planning is really important as well. Some of you all out there might already be saying, you know, I've been planting good seeds for a really long time, but I don't ever see much of a harvest. We must remember it takes patience. It takes patience to experience a good return. And sometimes you will not even see that on this side of heaven. Patience, although so difficult to maintain, trust me, I know, whether it's from a field crop or whether it's from dealing in a spiritual sense, it's easy to want to give up planting when you feel like your seeds aren't showing you results that you want them to show you. James 5, 7 and 8, James was writing to the Christians who had been scattered from persecution and they were living for God, but instead of getting the harvest they were expecting, they were being mistreated and they were facing difficult challenges. But listen to what James tells them. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. He tells them to be patient and he gives them the example of a farmer. The farmer has to be patient for his harvest and for the rains for both, he has to wait patiently. Farmers don't always see a yield to their harvest. You never know what could happen. There's so many elements that, that will make it good or bad. And it might be the same thing for us. We may not ever see it. We may not ever know. But we can't give up planting it. We can't give up doing what God is asking us to do. We keep planting the seed and God will water the seed. And we will reap the harvest eventually, but we can't give up. You know, Paul writes in verses 9 and 10 of our text, Let us not become weary in doing good. For all the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up. He's telling us for at the proper time, we just have to wait. And then he goes on to say, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. If you are tired today because you've been planting that seed but not seeing any results, the message to you is simple. Just keep doing it. Keep doing good. The results will one day come. And Paul tells us, you're going to get tired, but don't stop. Don't give up. He encourages us to keep doing good for all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Now, I don't want you to get confused on that last statement. We are to do good with everyone, no matter what, everyone. But we're supposed to be intentionally purposeful with other believers. We should restore those caught in sin with a gentleness and a humility and speaking with love and to help them carry their burdens. We want to ask God to help us plant the good seed in the ground. Help us to grow in faith in our relationships so we're not shallow and so we're not weak. But we are deep and we are mature and our roots are settled and firm in Jesus Christ. We got to ask him to grant us faith to move those mountains, those mountains of doubt and fear and teach us to triumph over sin. 
You know, we want him to help us to believe, even when we don't understand, that all we have to do is have patience. Just let him take us, shape us, and make us who he wants us to be. If we do all that, we will see him in eternity. Because God has given us so much promise. Pick up the Bible, read it. There is promise all through there. And that promise is to live forever with him. Amen.